so Monday morning, I was just kind of hanging out, I guess. Uh, sometimes, you know, after I, if I do some Bible reading or praying, sometimes I just, I just kind of sit. <laughs> and sometimes that's where God kind of speaks to my heart. Not always. Sometimes I just daydream. But sometimes God interrupts those daydreams and, and shares something with me. But as I was sitting there, it, all of a sudden, just really clear, I got this impression, almost, almost exact words, uh, not audibly, but in my heart. And I felt like God said, um, AI, which is artificial intelligence, is quickly becoming a God to many people and will become a God to a lot of people. I'm like, whoa. And I kind of, that wasn't shocking to me in, in one sense, uh, because I've, uh, I don't know if you've seen any interviews with Elon Musk, you know, the Tesla guy and the SpaceX guy. Elon Musk was very instrumental in kind of starting this artificial intelligence. If, uh, artificial intelligence, AI, for, I'm not a scientist, I probably can't explain it very well, or maybe I can explain it better because I'm not a scientist. But like, if you had like a thousand people of the smartest people in, in the room and all their brains were connected, you could get a lot of information from that, right? Well, AI is like, well, I don't know how many thousands of computers, but the, the, the biggest, uh, most powerful computers in the world network together where you can access information at the speed of light, literally, and have that available. It, what AI, through computers, is, is able to do now is stunning. Uh, and I, I, didn't, I didn't get a video of this, but they probably would have given me a copyright ding anyway. I just saw um, a video last week where it was on a news program, a trusted news program, where AI has written a song. And it had like 15 million downloads the first week because it's a really good song. It's, it's rap, so it's probably not my you know, genre so much, but, but people who like that said, that is an amazing song, all written by a computer because it took what people like and took that and it actually made a song. It's writing poetry. That's actually, people said, it's, it's pretty good poetry. AI right now can write you a report for college. You can ask ChatGPT to say, hey, give me a 2,500 word essay on, um, I don't know, federalism or whatever, you know, what, just name the topic. Boom, it's there. And, and so a lot of people are like learning how to deal with this, like teachers, college professors and high school teachers, how, how do we know if students are like really putting in the work and doing this or are they just going on and in 30 seconds getting a report? So there's, it's a double-edged sword to be sure because medicine is starting to use artificial intelligence now because it can take all the diagnosis in, literally in the world and like you come in and put some symptoms in and it'll say, you probably have this. And this is how, this is the most successful treatments. So it's not just one doctor working with his, in his realm of experience. It's literally probably tens of thousands of doctors all over the world whose experience is in the computer database that's coming out. So you can see there can be some really promising things as far as AI goes, right? But you can also see <laughs> that people could use it for nefarious means, right? For not good things. It's just like a lot of things, like the internet itself can be very powerful. It can also be a dangerous place, right? And, and so, um, but Elon Musk, getting back to him, he was, uh, had an interview uh, with a guy who used to be on TV named Tucker Carlson. And, it, um, and you know, he was, he's basically said that people, that AI could become a god to people. Because what do people turn to God for? Help, right? So if AI can help diagnose your disease, and AI can actually help you maybe cure a disease, or AI can give you relational relationship advice, or AI can actually teach your children, tutor your children in a certain subject, um, that could be pretty amazing. That, that's happening now. Um, 
One of the things, uh, there's a guy named Ray Kurzweil. He's kind of the father of this AI stuff. He, he's an older guy now. And he's a brilliant scientist, but he's kind of out there. And, he, and here's what he's seen for the future. This is going to be weird, but just so buckle in. And some of you have heard this. He's looking for a time when they can interface your brain with a computer, and they're getting pretty close to that now. But where there, where there are ways off is where you would download your brain, your mind into a computer and live forever in, in virtual reality. Like, Mike, you're a pastor. What are we talking about this stupid stuff for, right? I'm just telling you what's going on in our world, okay? I'm just, because there's, perp- there's, there's going to be a purpose here in a minute. Um, it's their version of eternal life. It's like, so now these are people that don't know that there's eternal life through Jesus Christ, all right? They just think that, and they, they don't understand um, body, soul, spirit. To you, you're just one thing, but they, they understand your soul or whatever, your mind is probably could live on, but if not, it could just, it dies and turns to dust and you're, to, you're just out of commission for eternity, that's, that's what they're looking like. But, so how could we live forever? And so for those people, it's like, okay, would you, would you be okay with just dying and going out of commission, you know, when you get however old? Or would you be willing to upload your brain into a, a computer and live virtually, have virtual experiences for eternity? I mean, it would, it, you could see where people who don't know Jesus could like, hmm, let me think about that, right? So here's how fast this is going, and it's coming faster than you would expect. There is a, um, well, at least one group, and I believe it's in South Korea, that are, they're using AI, and this is going to be kind of hard to hear, to reunite living people with their dead relatives. It's not a real reuniting, but they recreate the person who has passed on, and in virtual reality, you put the goggles on, right? And they put the gloves on so you can see and kind of feel, and they recreate the person who has died so that you can interact with them. It's weird, but they're doing it. And there are a lot of people like saying, oh, this is so wonderful because this mom who lost her daughter can be reunited. And there are other people like, they never get closure. And is it really the daughter? Here's a, I want to show you this video. It's about a two and a half minute video uh, that, that shows this one, one instance. So take a look at this. What is that? Ma. Oh, ma. In the 21st century, ghosts do exist. After four years, she can see her again. She can hear her again. But as hard as she tries, Jang Ji Sung can't touch her dead daughter, Nayeon. For this is a digital recreation of the girl who died from leukemia in 2016, age seven. Just pixels in a headset and a voice in some headphones. Meeting her daughter's avatar has been a complex and deeply emotional experience for this grieving mother. If Nayeon were alive, she would now be 11 years old and it's heartbreaking to see that her time has stopped at the age of seven. But I was so happy to see her that way. The reunion has been made possible by advances in virtual reality. People often think that technology is cold. We decided to participate in this project to see if the technology can comfort and warm people's minds when it is used for people. The South Korean studio used photos and her mother's memories of Nayeon and the movements of a child actor. It was filmed in a two-part documentary for South Korean broadcaster MBC called Meeting You. The film's been a big hit, but producers have had to defend themselves against accusations they've emotionally manipulated a distraught family for viewer ratings. 
떠나간 가족들을 과연 We thought about the ways in which people can meet their lost family members. If they were to meet, what can they talk about? What do they want to talk about? This is the biggest motivation of this project. Jang says her last wish was to tell Nayeon she loved her and has never forgotten her. Rory challenges Al Jazeera. It's kind of hard to watch. I mean, I feel for that mother, right? I feel for her. And but did you see what the creator says? He's like, we're we're bringing comfort to people through AI. And I, I guess what I what I'm trying to share with you, what I, I feel like was on God's heart, is AI is quickly becoming a god to a lot of people. God, the Holy Spirit, is called the Comforter. Because God knew we would need comfort in this life, right? And um, and Jesus is the one who gives us eternal life. And they're talking about how people could have eternal life through AI. Do, do you see where this could be heading for people? Um, so, <laughs> we're going to talk about I feel like God God didn't stop there. So that was kind of part one of the revelation. It's like AI is quickly becoming a god. And before long, a lot of people will look at AI towards God. Okay, that was kind of part one. Part two, right after that, I felt like the Lord said, they're going to give this God an image and a name. Like, and they could, they could do that now. I don't know if you've seen holograms, and, and of course they have robots that look real, but, I, but they have holograms that project, like there, right now there's technology that I could be anywhere else in the world, and a hologram projector could project my image speaking to you right now. I mean, it wouldn't look exactly, I mean, totally like me, but it would be pretty close. That technology is available now to put an image with this, I don't know, voice. And I felt like the Lord said, they're, they're, eventually they're going to give it a name. I, I, you know, our God has a name, Yahweh. When Moses said, who, sh- who should I say? He's like, Yahweh, that's his personal name of our God, right? So this AI becomes an image with a name whatever that, that God is. And I'm like, whoa, I can, I can see that. Because when you give it an image and a voice and a name, it makes it very personal. Right? We, we talk about our God, our Yahweh God, as being a personal God. The Yahweh, the reason he gave us the name Yahweh, but basically what he's saying is, this is my personal name. Right? This, is, this is who I am. I'm a personal God. I... I created you to be with me in this relationship. Uh, you would think that would be hard to duplicate, and it, it is. It's very hard to duplicate. But the enemy and the secular world without God always tries to come up with something that's like God, right? But not God. Something that we make a God in our own image, say the humanists, right? So, so that technology really is pretty much here, how soon will it be before people start looking to that as God? I feel like the Lord said, pretty soon. How, how will we respond? How should we respond? So this was the third part of the revelation. And, and then this was clear. He said, that's why we need a generation of Elijahs. Like, Elijahs? What? <laughs> um, and so I, I got to thinking about that. And so this, I want to kind of move on to what I believe is, is the message from the Lord and, and from his word today. So Elijah, uh, you've, most of you have heard that name, right? He was a prophet of God. He was a spokesperson for God from 900 BC to about 850 BC. For it's about 50 years, uh, 900 years before Christ, 850 years before Christ. So way back. 
And uh, he, God would speak to him and tell him what to speak to the people. And, and he would do that. It wasn't always, um, <laughs> it wasn't always well received. At the time, Elijah was a prophet. Israel, the nation of God's people, were flip-flopping back and forth from following Yahweh God and Baal. Baal was a false god, although and we could te teach this in another sermon, most false gods do have some power behind them because it's demonic power. Some false gods are just a piece of wood or metal or whatever with zero power. Some false gods do have some power because it's demonic power, all right? Baal would be one of those. So the nation of Israel, who's supposed to serve God and God alone, begins to, like, I don't know, follow Baal and forgetting about Yahweh God, at least not serving him. Elijah pretty much gets sick of that. And he goes, you guys got to make a decision. We're God's people. We follow God. So here's what he does. He calls, uh, summons 400, the 450 prophets of Baal. There were 450 prophets of Baal. There was 400 prophets of Asherah. This was our king Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab supposedly was like part of God's people, but he wasn't serving God. Jezebel certainly wasn't serving God. And they had 450 prophets of Baal in the king's court. Well, are you know, spread out in, in, in the kingdom. So Elijah calls them all to Mount Carmel. And if you, if you take the trip to Israel with me in November, you will go to Mount Carmel and you will see where this all went down. Um, Elijah chooses Mount Carmel because it's, it's kind of centrally located, but it's really um, sort of the home ground of Baal. Like it's Baal's home court. All right, so... Elijah goes there, like, hey, I'm coming to your home court. We're going to play some ball. So um, you can read the whole story in 1 Kings 18 and going into 19. I'm just going to take out a few excerpts here so you get the idea of what's going on. All right, so 1 Kings 18, starting in verse 23, this is Elijah talking to the prophets of Baal. And this is all with King Ahab's agreement. He says, get two bowls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. So they had a big pile of wood, right? I will prepare the other bowl and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the prophets said, what you say is good. They're like, I'll take you up on that. Game on. So just so envision this: two piles of wood, firewood, and two slaughtered bulls laying on top because that's how they would sacrifice, right? To either Baal or Yahweh God, and whoever, who, whatever God brings down fire and consumes the sacrifice, that's the real God, and. By the way, Baal was known, supposedly, <laughs> to bring fire from heaven. That's kind of what he was, that was one of his deals, right? That was one of his tools and his toolkit, supposedly. So he's just like he's playing right into like Baal's uh, game. So just to prove uh, that God is a supernatural God, Elijah says, oh, on my wood pile, I want you to bring a bunch of water and pour, soak the wood with water. Pour water all over the wood. And they poured so much water on the wood that they had dug a trench around it and filled the trench full of water. So dry wood and a bowl on Baal's pile, wet wood and a bowl on Elijah's pile. Right. First Kings 18, verse 36. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed. Oh, wait, I got to back up. Um, so... The, the prophets of Baal got to go first. And they start calling out to Baal, Baal, bring fire. And they're dancing and singing and bringing fire, and there's no fire. And it goes on for hour after hour 
after hour. They're crying out to Baal and there's no fire. (laughs) And Elijah starts getting kind of, I think kind of funny, kind of cynical. He's like, you know what? Maybe Baal's busy. Maybe he's, (laughs) some translations don't say this as nicely, but it's like, maybe he had to use the bathroom. That's really what he's saying. Like, he's just kind of making fun of them. Like, they, they begin to cut themselves to draw blood, to, to draw Baal's power, his attention. Nothing happens hour after hour. Now we pick it up in verse 36 of 1 Kings 18. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. (laughs) Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord is God, the Lord, he's God. It's like, whoa, like, That got their attention. So, what does it mean? So when when God, through his spirit, spoke to me last week and said, that's why we need to raise up a generation of Elijahs. I think that's what he was talking about. So like, are we supposed to call fire down from heaven and destroy computers? Right? I mean, not saying that couldn't happen, but... Is that how God would operate? Maybe. I mean, if he tells us to do it, I guess we'll do it. I just, probably that's not going to happen. So what what does it look today to to do what Elijah did back then, call fire down from heaven, to prove God is is God? Um, Because Elijah's demonstration of the one and only true God turned a whole nation back to God. Now, not everybody turned. Ahab didn't turn and Jezebel didn't turn. But, but really, many of the, the grassroots of the nation of Israel turned back to God through that demonstration of God's power. Um, and he said this, and just, I'm going back, 1 Kings 18, 36. He said, let it be known today that you were God. That, that is what God highlighted to me is the main message for us today is let it be known that you are God. Let it be known to the world, God, that you're God. So here's the main point, and then we'll launch off from here today. The main point is the way we defeat other gods is there for their followers to see the real God at work in our lives. We're probably not called to call fire down from heaven and burn up computers. <laughs> not say I mean, if God tells you to do that, you know, go for it. But how we're going to change people um, to draw them back to the real God is for them to see the real God at work in our own life. So, other than calling fire down from heaven, what might that look like? Okay, well, here's number one. I've got three things uh, today, but here's one. Let God be known by the power in your life. This is... I, I love how much is in God's word for successful Christian living. But one of the things that, that I guess, you know, going back in my upbringing and through my years of church attendance, if there's one thing missing from God's people, it's his power. Because, because Jesus said, Matthew 10, 7, 8, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Like, do stuff, right? The stuff I'm doing, you should be doing. He was, he was pretty clear about that. Um, 1 Corinthians 4.20 says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Now, I'm, I'm talking now, and we need to talk. We need to preach, right? We need to teach the word of God. But so many churches and so many pastors and so many teachers stop at teaching. They just talk. At some point, 
It's like, stop the talk and let's get on with the action. Let's see, let's see God's power at work in your life. Let's see all the stuff you're talking about and arguing about. Let's see it at work in your life. And so many Christians are like, uh, uh, well, read the Bible. <laughs> the, Bible say, the Bible says that you're supposed to read, be doers of the word, not just hearers, right? Even Jesus said this. Mark 16 and uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. This is right before Jesus is, ascends to heaven. This is after his death and resurrection. And before he ascends to heaven, he says this. He says, and these signs will accompany those who believe. Do you believe? So who, this is like, it doesn't say these signs will accompany the original 12 apostles. Or these signs will accompany pastors. No, it says, these signs will accompany those who believe. And I hope that's y'all. Or should I say all y'all? I'm not Southern enough. It's one of those two. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. And they will place their hands on the sick and they will get well. That's the words of Jesus. Now, time out. I've, I explained this before, but I feel like I always have to explain this. When he's talking about picking up snakes and drinking poison, he's not like, hey, go play with snakes to prove how awesome I am. Or drink poison just to see if you live. There are a few weird churches down south that do that. that that's not what this means. It means when, especially in that day when, when, when uh, people were traveling in the desert, and this still happens in India, by the way, people get bitten by snakes, and you can die. When you're out in the wilderness traveling and reaching unreached people, it's dangerous. And they would, they would drink water that could kill you because it had stuff in it. Or they'd, they'd eat food that, I don't know, had botulism or something. And you, you could die from that poison. So it's like, when you're serving God, there's like a supernatural pr protection over you. So you can do what he's asked you to do. I remember the first time I went to India... I forgot to get, like, until it was too late, to get any um, inoculations, or vaccinations. I'm like, all of a sudden, I'm two weeks from going to India, or a week going, like, should I, should I have gotten some shots? And so I, I went to the health department, like, yeah, you needed, like, hepatitis B, and the malaria thing, and, and typhoid fever, but those you need to get, like, three months ahead. And now... They'll let you in without those shots at your own peril. And so um, I just claim this, like, God, you said you'll protect us when we're about your business. So I claim that. And I, I did not get sick. And we were in some pretty interesting pond water baptizing people. <laughs> and I'm like, God, I'm trusting you. But, but do, you, do you see what I'm saying? Jesus said, for those who believe, as they're doing, as you're doing your thing, as you're taking the gospel message to the world, there'll be signs and wonders that accompany that. For all believers. It happened with Paul. Paul, probably the most famous missionary, Apostle Paul, traveled all around basically the known world at that time. And... Um, he talks about that he wasn't very eloquent, but he, thousands and th tens of hundreds of thousands of people came to a life saving, saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through his preaching, which he said was not eloquent. And he says this, Romans 15, 19. He says, They were convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's Spirit. In this way, I have fully presented the good news of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum. That's up northern Italy. What, what Paul's saying is like, it wasn't enough for me just to go talk. It wasn't enough just to go preach truth. Although that's important. Okay? You need to know the truth and you need to be able to share that. You need to be able to talk that. But at some point, there needs to be a demonstration of what you're teaching happening in your life and the lives of those you're preaching to. That's, that's the biblical model. So, we need, we need for people to see the power of God at work in our life and in the lives around us.
number one. Number two, let God be known by the fruit in your life. A lot of people think a fruitful life is like a big bank account and a successful family and nice house and good job, and, that's for, and, and that could be good fruit. And God wants those for you. Okay, so those are, that's all good stuff, right? But when we're, that's not, kind of, that's not the fruit I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fruit that the Bible talks about, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's listed in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and first part of 23. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You don't, you don't work to try and develop this fruit in your life. You follow the Holy Spirit, you yield to the Holy Spirit, and as you yield to the Spirit, let him lead and guide you and walk in his way, this fruit happens. I told this, I got a new vehicle, I need a new bumper sticker. I said, years ago, years ago, um, I said, we should get a bumper sticker that says fruit happens. Because there's a lot of other bumper stickers that say other stuff happens, right? But <laughs> we, we, should, we could like Christianize it, fruit happens. Because it's like, oh man, I, I, I need to be more loving. I need to have more joy in my life. Or I need more peace. I gotta work on more peace. I gotta work on more love. I gotta, like, no, I mean, God bless you for your, your willingness. It's just not gonna be very effective. What you need to do is work on yielding to the Holy Spirit. What you need to do is allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through you. When that happens, there will be love. There will be joy. There will be pay, peace and patience and kindness and good, all that stuff. It'll be there. Do you understand? And, and so <laughs> that's attractive to people. When, when people see someone with peace and joy, they're like, are they part of a cult? Right? Like, what's the matter with them? Like, back in the day, you could have peace and joy, and it didn't draw a lot of attention because at least a few people had it. Now, with just this intense, negative world that we're living in, it's like, if you have any peace and joy, people are like, uh, like what drugs are you on? Because I want some of those, right? It's like, it's, it's the Holy Spirit in me that's causing that. Fruit of the Spirit. That makes God known. And number three, let God be known by the confident hope in your life. Biblical hope is not like worldly hope. Worldly hope is like um, wishful thinking. <laughs> Biblical hope is like, no, I know it's going to happen. It just hasn't happened yet. Like, like the return of Jesus and us being with him forever and ever in a perfect place. That hasn't happened yet. But I know it's going to, and that's my hope, right? It's, it's a, this confident assurance of, of something that's not yet happened is going to happen. Hope is also attractive. And I can tell you this as a pastor who meets with a lot of people throughout the week, hope is increasingly diminishing among people. People are losing hope for lots of reasons that we don't need to go into. Like, but God wants you to have hope, this confident hope of, of what, like what's going on and, and we focus on the wrong things, we can lose our hope. Romans 15, 13 says, this is Paul. He says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you, and you means you, completely with joy and peace because you trust him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of Holy Spirit. That's Paul's prayer for you. That's, that's, that's the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul. Like, Paul, pray this for people because this is the heart of God, that they would have joy and peace and hope. And not just hope, but confident hope. And it's all got to come from the Holy Spirit. Right? So when you have that confident hope, that gets people's attention. And it, and it gets, the Bible says, it's going to get people's attention, and you're going to have to be ready to, to talk about that. I know it's, 
a matter of not just talk, but power. But you've got to be ready to share why you have that. Because here's what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. He's talking, he's talking about the world, like the ungodly world who just chastises you for being a Christian or maybe even threatens you. Actually, the word he uses intimidates, uh, the Greek, original Greek word that the New Testament was written in. Like the world wants to intimidate you if you're a Christian. Like that was true 2,000 years ago. How true is that now? Like it's like really true now. But here's what he says. Do not fear their threats. Actually, Greek word intimidations. Don't fear their intimidations. Don't be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. People are going to notice. Peter knew this. And that's why the Holy Spirit had him write this down. When you walk in confident hope of who you are in Jesus Christ and where you're headed and all that you have uh, through him, and you have that confident hope, which brings peace and joy, people are going to take notice and they're going to like, why are you like that? You're different, and you're different in a really good way. The Bible says you better be ready to say, well, here's why. <laughs> Could you do that? Like, could you do that right now? Maybe not. But you, you should be ready to do that. Why are you hopeful? Why do you have peace? Like when people start seeing these things in your life, when you're revealing God, when you're making God known, like it doesn't have to be from calling fire down from heaven, but when you're making him known, people are going to take notice. And they're going to be like, where is that coming from? Because that, I, I could do that. I want to do that. We need to be ready to share that. Are you prepared to do that? When people look at your life, is, do they see any evidence of God at work? Do they see any evidence of his power? I'm not saying that to guilt or shame anybody um, because it's available. Are you allowing it to work in your life? Are you stepping into that realm? Are you just kind of, have you just sort of laid down and died and let the world come at you? Holly laughs because she knows I'm speaking truth, right? I mean, because it's, I've, I've, I've kind of felt like that. Like, you get in a funk, right? That's, what, that's the best term I can use. You get in a funk. I was in a funk a year ago for a while. And it's like you just, you realize you just kind of go numb and just kind of lay down and let stuff happen. And, and like all of a sudden, like, no, what am I doing? I'm going to rise up. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. I have all the power of the creator in me and the power of the Holy Spirit working in me and through me. I don't, I don't have to live this way. And it's like, oh man, when, when people see that, that's evidence of God's work in your life. When people look at your life, do they see love? Do they see joy? Do they see peace, patience, kindness, goodness? Yes. That, I see that in Tannis. Self-control. Do they see that? The fruit of the Spirit. Yes. And it's like, if, if, if you're like, well, they should see it. I better get to work on it. Okay. Again, you don't work on that, you work on yielding to the Holy Spirit. You work on being filled with the Holy Spirit and letting him work in you and through you. So, raising up a generation of Elijahs, I know that, I, I just, I know it's from God, right? I just know that. So that we can defeat the artificial gods. There's an artificial God on the rise. And he's going to have some power. He, I'm going to give it like it, okay? It's going to have some power. It will probably have an image. It will probably have a name, whatever. It's still going to have some power and it's going to make a lot of promises. And some of those promises, it's going to kind of, in a weird sort of counterfeit way, kind of deliver on. In a way that very, falls very short of what the real God can do, but yeah. still offers something above what the world is experiencing right now. How do we defeat that? God, people, 
People gotta see the real God at work in your life. And here's the thing. It's like, well, do I call fire down from heaven? So here's a newsflash. You don't need to do that because it's already happened. 2,000 years ago, after Jesus ascended to heaven, he sent his Holy Spirit. And John the Baptist, a few years before that said, when Jesus comes, he's going to bring fire. When Jesus comes, and he meant it in a good way, when Jesus comes, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And here's what happened. Um, Ten days after Jesus ascended to heaven, Acts 2.4, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. This is the believers. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. If you're here today and you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit in you. If you, if you haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I implore you to do that. And all you have to do is invite him, receive him, accept him. And the moment that happens, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell you. The Holy Spirit in the Bible is often referred to as fire. Sometimes water, but often fire. And those tongues of fire came and sit on those first believer's head. Now, you probably haven't had a tongue of fire on your head but you have the fire of the Holy Spirit in you. All right, he was showing us you have fire. God has called down fire from heaven in the Holy Spirit to fill you to do what he's asked you to do so that people can see the power of God in your life and every false God can be defeated in Jesus' name. And you don't have to call real fire down from heaven. You don't have to do that. You just have to live with the fire of the Holy Spirit in your life. People see the fire they see the power of that and they see the fruit of that. They see the hope that comes from that. I'm like, whoa, that's how we bring fire now. We need a church, and I'm not having just a local church, I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ. We need a generation of people who will say, I'm gonna get fired up. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna fan the flame of the Holy Spirit in me and I'm gonna burn hot and I'm gonna show the power of God. And I'm going to yield to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to show love and joy and peace and patience. Do you ever think calling down fire from heaven is like love and joy and peace and patience? Right? It's amazing. That's the fire this world needs right now. But for that to happen, his people, God's people need to get fired up. And I'm telling you, I've, I've spent my numb days grousing around, complaining about our world. When, when Jesus says, come on, get up, get fired up, get on fire. Call that fire down. Fan that flame. There's a spark in there. It's smoldering, but fan it so people can see the real God at work in your life. I'm kind of preaching myself excited. <laughs> okay. I hope you... I wanted to paint a picture as we started... What, what we can see in the natural world with this whole artificial God thing, right? If you, if you haven't been seeing it, you will see it. It's coming. It's nothing to fear, but it's also nothing to ignore because millions, hundreds of millions of people are gonna be deceived by it. And I'm not saying there aren't some good things, some good aspects to it, but they're going to get sucked into that as a God. And that's going to become their God at the peril of knowing the real God. So we as God's people need to show him as the real God. We need to echo those words of Elijah. God, let them know that you are God. And we need a fire in us to do that.